Hi, Get Unstuck Nation. Please welcome my lovely friends right here, Meg and Dali from Meg and Dali CFO. So Meg and is a number translator for creative business owners and Meg and helps them overcome their fear and embarrassment around the number side and something that their business still stuck right now so that they can make a smart decision moving forward and growth in their business. Thank you so much for joining Get Unstuck Radio today, Megan. It is my pleasure, Montita. I am so happy to be here. Yeah, I'm so excited because like we are so aligned with many things, you know, like when I just speak something, Megan already gets it and I'm like, I'm very proud. <laughs> <laughs> Before we get into your expertise, Megan, um, can you share with me and also my audience a little bit how you started your entrepreneurial journey? So... Um, accounting. For some reason, I started off, I'm a very, I have an artsy brain, but I have a very math brain. And so when I first started into accounting, it was this neat little tiny thing that could tell stories. And then it kind of evolved as small business started coming to me. And they're like, I have this problem. Like, I can't see it. I'm like, ooh, let's see what the story is in your numbers and take a look. And so one of them, like the first person that I ever helped independently, like I wasn't working for a job for somebody else. Um, she was actually one of our consultants at the company I was working for. And I pulled up one of her invoices and I was like, oh, honey, there's no way that you can be making a living off of what you're charging. And so I called her because she's a friend of mine. I'm like, honey. And she's like, how did you know I wasn't making any money? So I was like, the math doesn't work. You just can't do it. Um, and so like immediately overnight, her business just changed. And she was like, she could hire her husband. Her husband was able to quit his job and come to work for her and like, these massive shifts just right away, just from understanding how the numbers needed to work in her business. I was like, maybe I'm onto something. And then more people would come and like, hey, I think my partner's stealing from me. Yeah, your partner's stealing from you. Yeah. Or hey, how, why am I, I've been in business for so long. I have no money left over. Like, yeah. And then I could show them how the numbers work. And that's kind of how it evolved from there. Wow, amazing. I couldn't stress enough how important the number is. I mean, I'm not good at it as well, but I'm learning every single day. I'm trying to be better because even yeah. though you have someone to do this thing for you, but you still want to know exactly what it is, right? Yeah, yeah. And like, that's how most businesses start. Like, you are good at a thing. You are great at a thing and people will pay you money to do your thing. And so the money, also, also the numbers become like this afterthought of, hey, I'm making this money, I'm making deposits in my bank account, it feels so good. And they're like, wait, um, and people don't go get accounting degrees, right? When they're like, I'm going to start a business, well, I better go get my accounting degree. That's not how it works. <laughs> it's the reverse of that. And you actually don't need an accounting degree. You just need to know how to make the numbers in your business work. You don't need to know everybody's business for you. What are the, what's the nice right number structure you are there difference between each um let's say small business owner we got into their core numbers that they have to be aware of yes yeah everybody's independent and that's um why i like to work one-on-one -on -one with people because mm. what you do for your clients and what they're willing to pay and the structure that you deliver that value to them is going to be different for everybody and on top of that like even your mindset around money or what you need to get out of your business versus how much effort you want to put into it. It's so different for everybody. Absolutely. There are universal rules that you can apply across the board. Like you have to bring in more than you spend that type of thing. But when we're talking about the intricacies about why it's working or not working for your particular business, there's going to be different answers. I want you to touch base on this. So I caught this from somewhere in your content, but I really love it. So you said that cash projection is the most important thing. Like you can hyper focus on cash projection because you will know exactly what is working in your business, what needs to be happen in your business. And also you able to look ahead in the future, how your business will survive. Can you stress a little bit about that? How important it is? And I just want my audience to hear that, like for real. Yeah, absolutely. So your financial statements don't matter, okay? They don't matter. Your income statement and balance sheet, when you're, especially when you're first starting out, those don't matter until you're a multi-million dollar business. And I'll tell you why. Your income statement points to things in the past. 
Do I use my income statements for my clients? Yes, but only to catch the trends so we can start projecting the future. Mm -hmm. What matters mm -hmm. most is that you are not going to run out of oxygen. You're not going to run out of cash while you're running your business and growing your business. In the balance sheet, it's a snapshot of your health today, right? And it, it can tell you things about the past. And this goes, I'm going to do a little bit of a side right? There is your bookkeeper. Same as like your income statement is in the past. Your bookkeeper organizes all of this past information. Your tax professional CPA is interested in that past information. Yeah. But what your mm -hmm. business is about is the future. We learn from the past, absolutely. But if you can't see where your cash balance is for the next six to 12 months, that's what's keeping you up at night. Like, how am I going to pay my employees? What's around the corner? When is the other shoe going to drop? All of this angst and those yucky feelings come when you don't know what your cash balance is going to be in the, even the near future. Even a three month cash flow can make you feel really, it can just be a relief. Even if the answer is, oh, I need to go find another $5,000 in sales. Oh, at least you know that three months ahead of time. And when you can see those peaks and valleys in the next 12 months, and you know that, ooh, March is going to be really good, but I got to watch out for May. You can use March to cover May. So May isn't this terrible digging out of a whole type of month. You can see that ahead of time and start smoothing it out. And that's how you run your business for the first three or four years. Until you are that multi-million dollar business, you have to run off of future cash flow. That's the, mm -hmm. that's the only thing to do it. But not to use the future money, right? Mm -hmm. But to predict that. Yes. 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 We want to predict the future. We want to like, the, I can't emphasize enough the amount of, of pressure it takes off of you when you have that information and you can start making so much better business decisions that way. Business decisions made in a panic are not good decisions. Yeah. Not a good decision at all. So <laughs> in that case, like, you know, um, when we're recording this, this is still like in January time, like people still making the this year planning, for example, and they usually have the revenue goal first. How this number comes up? So the future cash flow number specifically, yeah, that one? Goal, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I actually use, um, I'll use your income statements because I need to know like, what are your spending habits? What are your revenue habits? Like, what are you used to having? Um, and I also need to know how much you need to put in your pocket to support your family, right? Like we can't, we can't discount the importance of how your business is supposed to be serving you. And then we look at your pipeline and what kind of projects you have that you're working on and what we expect those projects to, to bring in, right? And not just in the, like the fantasy world of, yes, this next project is going to be $100,000 a month with zero costs along with it. I mean, it's very easy to get distracted by what this next new project, how great it's going to be. Um, I also want you to be, get very real about the time that's going to be involved in it. Like, do you have the resources and the capacity to do this next project or all of these things you have in the pipeline? What other resources do we need to bring in? And get very real about how that projected revenue is going to cost you cash in that same period or how where are the costs going to come months ahead of that cash coming in and if those costs come in months ahead of this cash coming in what happens if this cash never does come in mm. can we what is the risk that we're taking with these new endeavors and i want to take a look at it from every angle what if we're just consistent with what we have mm. what if what if we all the way back on your business and go right back to only the things that are working. How does that work for that cash left at the end of the month? And that's <laughs> as if you can see my hand, like that cash left at the end of the month for the next 12 months, that's the number I want to see after you pay yourself, after you pay the taxes, after you pay the debt service. Like, is there, are there any traps? Are there anything where that number becomes negative or becomes too big of a hole? And if it's negative, now it's the plan, right? Now we have months ahead of time that we're planning for that. Like, yep, I know I'm going to be $17,000 in the hole in May. So what's the plan for covering that? Do we go get a line of credit before we need one? Because I'll tell you a hint, banks don't give you a line of credit unless you really don't need one, right? So you might want to get that now while you have like the, hey, look at my fancy cash that I have now. Um, banks only want to really talk to you when you don't need them. Um, 
So what's the plan ahead of time? And we can get all of that and all of that peace of mind that comes with it early. Yeah, exactly. You mentioned something about keep doing what it's working. And that's also something that we always say. So don't change things that is not working. If it's working, keep it there, right? And keep the revenue yes. coming in on what works. Because you can play with your creativity on top of it anyway. But don't change what is working because that's your revenue is going to go on. Um, yeah. I definitely sure and I'm, I'm, I bet that your clients also, someone for sure, like to change things as well. So from financial perspective, for those who like changing project, like keep changing their, um, let's say, revenue of incomes every quarter, how do you deal with it? I mean, I couldn't be more headache for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's part of it. Like, okay, this is the effect of when you keep changing. We need to take what's working. Let's settle down. Let's take what's working. And let's protect it. What can we build around this one thing that is working that this, this is going to be your bread and butter if everything else goes to hell, <laughs> right? Let's, let's put our arms around it, wrap a blanket around it, maybe tie a bow on it and send it on its way of, yes, this thing is working for my company. Okay, now what can that contribute to play money, to all of these experiments that you want to try? Uh, it might be that it's not ready yet. Those play experiments, you need to, um, that might be a side project that you need to hustle, but we don't want to sacrifice stability for this new thing. So how do we separate those two? Um, sometimes it is, sometimes the conversation is like, you know, you can, just not yet. Or sometimes the conversation is, holy cow, this thing is so healthy for you, but let's not spend the whole kit and caboodle. Let's, let's make it your playground, right? Let's take some money out of the thing that's working and make it your playground, but only so much. Um, that extra pressure of this thing that you're working on, you'd have to take it seriously. It's not just like free for all money and I'll worry about it later. Um, giving somebody else to be that, that voice of reason I'm like, hey, did you see what happens six months from now if you keep doing that? Like, let's take a look at that now. And if they want to ignore me, that's their prerogative, right? Like, that's your prerogative. Go play. But at least they know six months ahead of time. Mm. So, yeah. So in that case, thinking about if the business owner is still doing the bookkeeping by themselves, like, would that make them feel overwhelmed? So I, I just realized like the other day, so I'm, I was talking to you as well before we like on the offline and I also came across like, oh yeah, this is what robot Hibasaki keeps saying in Wish That Her That. Hiring the bookkeeping, the bookkeeper as the first person that you're going to hire. Um, what's your opinion on that? Uh, it depends. <laughs> it depends. Um, sometimes you just, the money's not there. You just can't afford a bookkeeper. Um, and the, and you just need to do it yourself. Um, and that's okay. There's, I mean, it's okay. It's okay. Uh, unless you're one of these that are, I'm never going to do it until year end anyway. I'm just going to check my bank balance and see if I'm good. Um, there are things that can get missed, especially when it comes to debt service payments or annual fees that come out of nowhere that you're completely unprepared for. Um, there's, there's absolute dangers to be had if you're not keeping your books up to date. The other side of this is that you need to know what you are hiring your bookkeeper for. You need to understand your needs versus their capabilities and what they're really meant to do. A lot of times people hire a bookkeeper expecting like a full service accountant and a CFO all in one. Like they think that the bookkeeper is going to tell them what these pitfalls are. They think the bookkeeper is responsible for raising their hand and saying, hey, did you check out this thing? You're... That's not what bookkeepers do. Okay? Mm -hmm. Bookkeepers are taking your information and putting it in the right buckets. That's what, that, that's what they do. They, they put your information in the right buckets and make sure things reconcile at the end of the month. It's historical looking, mm -hmm. not raising red flags. Uh, they will raise a red flag if they're trying to pay your bills and they're like, there's no cash. What do you want me to do? Where, how do I pay these bills? Probably not what you want, right? So being very realistic about what you need, like, okay, I understand that I'm responsible for my own cash flow projections. I understand that I am responsible 
for the health and welfare of my business and knowing what the red flags are. What I need from my bookkeeper, I need it nice and tidy. And I want, I want them to reconcile weekly. I want them to, or maybe I want them to do all the invoicing. I want them to do the collection calls too. I want them to do, to pay my bills. There's a whole, you could get a bookkeeper that just does reconciliation. And that's fine. They might do just reconciliations and it might be super cheap. Or you might want a full service bookkeeper. You just have to know what you need personally to, um, to get that, that heft off of you and know what you can afford and what services you actually need. Now, in terms of doing your own bookkeeping, if it is costing you angst, if it is costing you this procrastination time, uh, that's a problem. That's a problem. We want you to have as much mental capacity to work in your business as you need without having to worry about the things that you could really easily give somebody else and take care of that. Um, a lot of members of my bookkeeping club, they come in, they're DIYers, right? They DIY their books, but they spend more time procrastinating. They spent more time procrastinating than actually working in their books because there's a lot of insecurity that comes with that. But once they have the, the know-how, and the support that it's going to be okay and and it's not a mental um burden it's not a mental burden anymore then they're fine that's fine if you can do your books without mental burden go for it if you can hire a bookkeeper and know exactly what you need and you can afford it go for it i really like when like when i read in your landing page on the bookkeeping cup um about once you set up the system and you can just come back and check this like three minutes a month. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, that's the, that's the future cash flow. Yes. So when you're doing your future cash flow, once you set that up, you can come in and update it. Doot, 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 and you know your next, you know if you're on track or not on track. Yeah. Ah, right. Yeah, that would be great, right? I mean, anyone feel excited? I always feel excited. I mean, I open my spreadsheet every morning though I check it every morning <laughs> it's give me joy in the morning that okay this is something that I'm gonna start the day with and I'm gonna end the day with different numbers <laughs> I'm gonna start the day knowing I'm okay and I'm gonna end the day knowing I'm okay yeah yeah I just love shaking them <laughs> <laughs> Good. That's good. That means you've got a healthy business and you're not like panicking. Your head's not in the sand and you can see that there's no train coming down the track. Yeah. I mean, if I get all expenses covered and I pay myself, that's it right now. <laughs> that's all I'm concerned. <laughs> yeah. That's why. And hopefully, Sorry. Yeah. And when you see that extra cash flow, the, the one thing I love about that is when you see all that extra cash flow, like, oh, I've got, I've got, I don't have any dicks at all coming. In fact, you know, I've got, I've got some nice piles building up. Then you can start building, you know, the, the um, safety nets and you can start giving yourself a little bonus. Go buy yourself some $3 shirts. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> oh yeah, this shirt is only $3, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to Thailand. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I have a lot of accounts. Like when I open my... How to say that um, mobile banking I already separate many of the buckets already so I just like what's money coming in and just keep it over <laughs> keep it I love <laughs> I <would> it not... <laughs> yeah my mom thought I'm crazy but that's just like a habit right now um going back to you I mean I think people also having another issue though that I came across like my clients for example um I couldn't keep saying them every time that you have to know your financial numbers to making decisions in your business. Even though I'm the operation strategist, but I have to help you making decisions based on your financial numbers anyway. Because that is your, um, how do you call it? I mean, it's, it's keep your business going, right? It's fed your business, like this thing. So how can you change number of people how can you know how many clients you're able to work with and how can you get back your time without knowing these numbers so that you can move forward further yeah how do you tell them regarding to their business capacity from CFO so, yeah you, you nailed it I mean numbers is the language of business right um 
And as a CFO, that's my, my responsibility is to help you understand what resources you have in what capacity they're being used. It might be, in fact, I had a client recently um, that's running at about 80% capacity, which is about peak capacity. You can't run everybody at 100% capacity 100% of the time. It just, it doesn't work. Um, you're going to burn somebody out and something's going to break, right? Yeah. So yeah. if you're running, um, to understand your capacity, I want to break down, first of, first of all, it's like truly what are you paying yourself per hour and is it really worth it what you're doing right now? And that can be really revealing for people when they realize that they're making $14 an hour. That's what I'm putting in my pocket for what I'm putting into my business. Um, and then we take a look at all of the, the components and is it really worth it? Capacity is a huge problem in small and startup businesses. Um, when like this client is saying, I want more clients, like, I, I need more clients, I need more revenue, but my people are, and my people are running at 80% capacity. I have room to grow. Why am I not making more money? It's like, wait a second. This is not a sales problem. Cause he's like out there. I was like, I just want to make more sales. Like you can't handle more sales. What happens if we start hiring, in this case, it was programmers now. What happens if we hire programs for the next, we hire two programmers, we get them up to speed in the next three months, how much is that going to cost? And in our future cash flow, we could see that yes, he could afford those three month ramp up time. And within three months, he had increased his sales by 50% with just two more programmers because the way he could serve his clients now, the capacity that his whole team had to serve the clients got much more, um, concentrated, right? So now instead of having six people, he has eight people running at 80% capacity, but that actually generated 50% more revenue, which um, pretty much tripled his profit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I always say that like when you're making some decision like that, like to scale or like increase more, I mean, add more number of people underneath, the result wouldn't happen right away. Like people want to get the like revenue triple or double right now after they change something in their business. And that's, that's not how it's roll, right? Right. You have to take into account, like how much time does it really take you with each one of your employees, right? You can't just hire them and ignore them. Do you have the time to take on another employee? Do you have the capacity to grow yet? Or are there things that need to get fixed first? You need to fix the flow within your business. And this is this is your specialty, right? This is mm -hmm. like how, how the workflow is going through the company. There are things where you're just not ready yet. Sure, you could probably go out and sell another $100,000 next month, but you are going to have some picked off customers. You're just not ready yet. Yeah. And yeah, sometimes they're not listening to me and I can't do anything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All That's I can do is be the voice of reason. <laughs> yeah, I already well. like, you know, ahead, like almost a year ahead. <laughs> <laughs> a year later, you're still facing the same problem. I don't know how to help you as well. Right, right. Yeah. Buddy, we so, talked about this. <laughs> yeah, I know. But yeah, it's a fact that like sometimes when you really want to increase your revenue, but your back end is not ready, it's, it's heartbreaking for me though. Like, and, and your money also going to lose because of that. Like, it's not cash collected. That's the point. When you get something like you got sales, like revenue coming in, but it's not all cash collected, right? Sometimes it will be six months later from now, but you already counted as a revenue already. So, um, and that's yeah. the threat, right? That's the threat of like, ooh, I sold this thing. Turns out you don't have the capacity for it. The customer is really upset. They're like, I'm not paying for that. And now all of your projections are like shot to heck because you didn't have your system set up right in the first place. Yeah. And in that case, we got, yeah, I know. In that case, we got into like the CFO and also the accountant perspective that way. How you guys keep on track with these issues? Because it's like day to day, really. And it's good effect quite a long term communication in the leadership mm. um 
you're, you're the people that you surround yourself with. They need to be working together. I don't want to be working independently of your bookkeeper and your tax person and your lawyer and your chief marketing officer and your, uh, your executive. You can't, we all have to be working in concert and communicating like, hang on, I see an issue and make sure that people also see what's coming down the track. And, and so you can work together as a team to work these out. Even if you have a team of like you and your mentor and your bookkeeper, you all have to be on the same page. Um, communicate, communicate, communicate. That's my answer. Yeah, hundred percent. So is that one of the um, criteria when you recruit a client? I would say recruit a client. <laughs> Yeah, one of the criteria is like, uh, introduce me. The first thing is introduce me to your bookkeeper. I need to know your bookkeeper. I need to know your tax person. Um, and if they're like, well, they're going to feel threatened if they know that I hired you. Red flag, red flag. <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I don't, I, I, I need to know what your tax person is giving you advice and like if they're telling you that you need to spend all of this cash in order to um, save on taxes that might be a short-term answer but I need to understand why you're sacrificing cash for a, a, a short-term pain where in the long term this cash could be better served and maybe I'm not seeing something that the tax I'm not a tax person I am no tax. maybe they're seeing something or they know something that I don't that they can come into that that projected cash flow and say, yeah, but look what happens on year two. I'm like, oh, okay. Now that changes things. Um, and if the bookkeeper, sometimes they do say th see things and they are too scared to raise their hand because it's out of their regular duties, right? Like, ooh, yeah, I knew you were going to run out of cash three months ago, but I didn't want to say anything because it's not my place. <laughs> oh, that's harsh. <laughs> <laughs> that's so yeah. harsh really wow mm. Mm. <laughs> yeah. yeah okay so yeah but how how okay since you mentioned that how as a cfo and also the tax uh advisor are you guys seeing things in different perspective or or what yeah so your tax your tax guy is trying to get your tax bill as low as possible right <laughs> And so I'll give you the classic example that I see all the time because I'm in South Dakota. We have a lot of agriculture. You'll see farmers right at the end of the year, they'll go out and they'll buy like a 60 or $80,000 pickup truck, right? Because they can expense it off. They can do accelerated depreciation, expense it off and save $20,000 on their taxes. Okay. Now, sure. They save $20,000 on their taxes for 2020. But now they're still paying another $60,000 for that truck for the next five years. Yeah. Short-term cash flow. Yep. Yeah, I have to, I, instead of paying a $50,000 tax bill, I'm paying a $30,000 tax bill. But for the next five years after, you have a $60,000 truck you have to still pay for. And you don't get to take any more tax breaks on it. Now what? Yeah. That's, that's, yeah. Like, that's like how, like, uh, um, clothing brand give you a discount, but you still have to buy more. Like that's exactly what it is. Yes, yes, yes. So knowing the language, knowing the numbers, knowing the impact, not just this year, because oh, I can't pay $30,000 for taxes or I can't pay $50,000 for taxes. Uh, but you can pay 60. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's what makes sense for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But that's, that's not how, I mean, it's perspective, right? Like if a tax guy's job is to reduce your taxes this year as much as possible, um, we need to be in communication of, okay, what's the long-term vision and making sure we're on the same page. Maybe he's got some other things up his sleeve that will help offset those cash out that isn't tax deductible anymore in future periods. I don't know. I gotta, I gotta be in communication with him to find out. Yeah, that's make a lot of sense. Wow. Oh, this thing. Anyone who's still listening to now, be sure you understand of your people <laughs> regarding to money because we don't want to have problem with IIS for sure. <laughs> mm, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, in case anyone listen to here and they know that, okay, Megan can be my CFO right now. 
where can they reach out to you then? There are two ways. One, you can just come on over to megandolly.com. It's M-E-G-A-N-D-A-H-L-E.com. And um, you can find a spot on my calendar. I'll be happy to talk with you. Or if you just want to like, mm, I want to find out more about her, you can go on over to gettingyourmoneyright.com. And um, you can stalk me that way if you don't want to make an appointment. <laughs> Yeah, all the link will be in the description below, everyone. So thank you so much, Megan, for joining today. This was such a pleasure, Mutita. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, thank you for enlightening me and my audience about the numbers today. You're welcome. Hey, thank you for watching this episode. If you enjoy the show, you can subscribe here or here. And this is the previous episode. Check it out. See you next time.